Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and today I'm going to deal with picture tests and practical anatomy of the thorax. The video today is about the thoracic wall, lungs, and pleura, part 4. You may use the video as a revision or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend some time to read the question and come up with the answer. Replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. A 20-year-old man is brought to the ER with a deep stab wound through the right fifth intercostal space, lateral to the sternum. Blood from the nose signifies a punctured lung, which of the structures of the lung is most likely pierced. Now regarding the surface anatomy of the lung, the lung extends from the apex on the right side, from the apex of the lung, crossing the sternoclavicular joint. This is the same surface anatomy of the pleura in the upper part. And then it reaches the midline behind the sternum at the level of the second coastal cartilage, manubrio sternal joint, descends down in the midline to the level of the sixth coastal cartilage. And then it passes around the thoracic wall to cross the sixth rib at the mid-clavicular line. This is two ribs higher than the inferior level of the pleura at the same vertical plane, the mid-clavicular line. Regarding the surface anatomy of the lobes of the right lung, the middle lobe of the right lung extends from the anterior border at the level of the fourth costal cartilage and follows the fourth rib until it intersects the oblique fissure. Regarding the oblique fissure, the oblique fissure intersects the inferior border of the lung at the level of the sixth costochondral joint and then follows the sixth rib and intersects the horizontal fissure. So this is the surface projection of the three-dimensional lung on the thoracic wall. It is obvious that the inferior lobe is not only inferior, but most of it is located posteriorly. And anteriorly, you have the upper and middle lobes mainly. Now, referring to the picture and the site of the stab wound, it is in the fifth intercostal space. Let's count the intercostal spaces. First, below the first rib, second, third, fourth, and fifth intercostal space. So that's the region of the fifth intercostal space, lateral to the sternum. And therefore, the stab will be in the middle lobe. It is not in the inferior lobe, not in the superior lobe, not in the apex, and not in the lingula because the lingula is a feature of the left lung, not the right lung. What is the side of the lung? Give three features shown in this view. Identify the structure. What is its homologue on the contralateral side? This is the left lung. I can easily tell because it has two lobes and one fissure, the oblique fissure while the right lung has three lobes and two fissures. There is no horizontal fissure here, and there is no middle lobe. The other feature that I can see here is the lingula, tongue-like process that represents the middle lobe of the right lung, and it belongs to the upper lobe of the left lung. Also, on the anterior surface, I can see that there is a very deep cardiac notch. So all these features, the presence of the cardiac notch, the presence of the lingula, the presence of two lobes and one fissure, all support the fact that this is the left lung. B is the lingula, and it is the homologue of the middle lobe of the right lung. Which mechanism of rib movement predominates in rib A? Name the joint B and specify its type. Rib A is the fourth rib. You can see that the first rib is concealed by the clavicle. Then you have the second, third, and fourth. On the surface of the body, you will not use the first rib for counting. You will use the sternal angle here. And then it is at the level of the second costal cartilage, then the third and fourth costal cartilage, and the fourth rib. Ribs move either by the pump handle mechanism where the anterior end of the rib is elevated and because the rib is oblique, there is increase in the anteroposterior diameter. This is true for the upper six ribs to which A belongs or the ribs they move by the bucket handle mechanism which implies elevation of the lateral part of the rib and this increases the transverse diameter and this is true for the lower ribs. Name the joint B and specify its type. The joint B is a chondrosternal joint. Chondro because it is between the costal cartilage and sternum. So it's the chondrosternal joint. Chondrosternal joints, except the first are synovial joints of the plane variety. The first chondrosternal joint is a primary cartilaginous joint. So the joint in B between the fourth costal cartilage and the sternum is a plane synovial joint. Name the facial thickenings 1 and 2. 
which fascia produces each one of them, identify the structure B, B specific. Let's deal with the facial thickenings first. These facial thickenings are in the form of arches. So they constitute arcuate ligaments. And they, at the same time, as you can see, they provide origin for the diaphragm. This is what we call the lumbar origin of the diaphragm. These arcuate ligaments, one of them is medial. So it is the medial arcuate ligament, number one. And the other one is lateral. It's the lateral arcuate ligament. They are thickenings of the fascia that overlies the muscles. The muscle here, just to the side of the body of the lumbar vertebrae, is the psoas major muscle. So the medial arcuate ligament is a thickening of the psoas fascia. And then lateral to psoas major is the quadratus lumborum muscle, which is covered by fascia called quadratus lumborum fascia, or it is the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia. And the thickening above produces the lateral arcuate ligament, which extends between the transverse process of a lumbar vertebra and the 12th rib. The structure B is one of the two crora of the diaphragm. This is the right crust of the diaphragm. The left crust is located on this side. And between the two crora of the diaphragm, you can see this is the aortic hiatus, where the descending thoracic aorta descends down to continue as the abdominal aorta. So B is the right crust of the diaphragm. At this location, the neurovascular bundle disappears as it becomes sandwiched between which muscle layers? You can see the neurovascular bundle, the intercostal neurovascular bundle related to the lower border of the rib. And here it disappears as it is covered by these muscle fibers that descend downwards and backwards. They are the innermost intercostal muscle layer. These muscle fibers are not present more medially because these muscle fibers only overlie the middle two quarters of the intercostal space. And so the neurovascular bundle will be sandwiched between the innermost layer and the intermediate layer, which is formed of internal intercostal muscle fibers. Identify the structure B, which type of fibers it carries B specific. This is a nerve, and if we follow it up, we will find that this nerve is formed by multiple roots arising from the sympathetic trunk. Note the sympathetic trunk beaded by the ganglia located on either side of the vertebral column, and that this nerve arises from the sympathetic trunk from its medial side. It is the greater splanchnic nerve. This nerve passes through the diaphragm and supplies the structures in the abdomen. In the sympathetic trunk, some of the preganglionic fibers that are carried by intercostal nerves are going to synapse, but other preganglionic fibers, they do not synapse in the ganglia, but leave the sympathetic trunk without synapsing and constitute the splanchnic or thoracic splanchnic nerves, of which this is the greatest. So the fibers that are carried in this nerve are preganglionic sympathetic fibers. They are going to synapse in the celiac ganglia, which are present in the abdomen. Which of the locations 1 to 5 represents the sternal angle? The sternal angle, or the angle of Lewis, is the angle between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. It is represented here by number 3. It is the site of the manubrio-sternal joint um, synthesis, a secondary cartilaginous joint, and is located at the level of the second coastal cartilage. It is a surface, easily palpable surface anatomical landmark. The other labeled structures, one is the jugular notch, two is the clavicular notch of the manubrium of the sternum. You can see it articulates with the medial end of the clavicle at the sternoclavicular joint. Four is a joint between the body and the xiphoid process of the sternum. And five is an angle between the xiphoid and the costal margin, costo xiphoid angle. What is the source of the anterior intercostal arteries in this intercostal space? This is the fourth intercostal space. If we start counting from the second costal cartilage, second intercostal space below, then third, and then fourth intercostal space. Here, in the upper six intercostal spaces, the anterior intercostal arteries are 
branches of the internal thoracic artery that passes vertically on the side of the sternum and provides anterior intercostal arteries until the sixth intercostal space where the internal thoracic artery splits into uh, superior epigastric and musculophrenic arteries. So in this space, the anterior intercostal arteries are derived from the internal thoracic or internal mammary artery. Match the letter dribs shown in this picture with the following numbered features. Each feature may be used once, twice, or not at all. A is the second rib and B is the twelfth rib. Now, one provides attachment for the diaphragm. The diaphragm has a costal origin from the lower six ribs. So B also provides attachment to the diaphragm. False rib. Ribs are divided into true ribs whose costal cartilages are attached to the sternum. False ribs whose costal cartilages are attached to the costal cartilage above and then to the sternum. So the true ribs are ribs 1 to 7. And then ribs 8, 9, and 10 are the false ribs. And then the floating ribs are the ribs whose costal cartilages are not attached to the sternum at all. So A is a true rib because its costal cartilage is attached to the sternum, and B is a floating rib because its costal cartilage is not attached to the sternum, so there is no marked rib that matches the false rib. Has a head that articulates with the body of two adjacent vertebrae. Ribs 2 to 9, their heads have two facets that articulate with the body of adjacent vertebrae. So rib A, its head has two facets. The upper facet on the head articulates with the lower demi facet on the body of T1, and the lower facet on the head articulates with the upper demi facet on the body of T2. Participates in the formation of the costal margin. The ribs that participate in the formation of the costal margin are ribs 7, 8, 9, and 10, and therefore neither of A or B participates in the formation of the coastal margin.